Are you ready to navigate the new way to work? Forbes Books presents Dare to Care in the Workplace with Kathleen Quinn Botaw. Here's Kathleen. Thanks for joining me once again for my conversation with Dr. Carol Swain, the author of award-winning books and articles relevant to understanding our culture. She is also the founder of Unity Training Solutions, which was launched to provide alternative DEI training for corporations, churches, and schools. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But first, Carol, I wanted to ask you about Black Lives Matter and critical race theory. You've been a vocal critic of both of those. And a few years ago, students petitioned to have you suspended or subjected to sensitivity training. Whereas most people would have placated them, you took the opposite approach. When did you become comfortable fighting back against the status quo? Well, let me tell you that discomfort in in the university came earlier. In Mm -hmm. 2011, my university, Vanderbilt, adopted a policy that Christian groups could not uh, require their leaders to have faith statements or codes of conduct. And so it meant that... um, To be a leader of a Christian organization, you did not have to affirm a belief in Jesus Christ, nor uh, could they have scriptures in their uh, bylaws or constitutions that say that you had to live a certain lifestyle. And so I was part of of a group of students and a handful of faculty people that fought back against that between 2011 and 2013. By then we had lost, but not without putting up a big fight where we had 35 members of Congress sign a letter asking the university to um, restore the religious liberty of Christian students, and we were all over the news. The students that were um, working with me graduated, you know, because a lot of them were undergraduate. So that happened in 20, um, between 2011 and 2013. 2015, I wrote an opinion piece in the local newspaper criticizing Islam. And mm-hmm. it was right after the Charlay Hebdo attack that occurred January 7, 2015. I wrote my opinion piece January 15, 2015. Mm-hmm. And it set off a firestorm and it mm-hmm. set off the protests. And what happened was, you know, I was attacked for being an Islamophobe. But then the LGBT students got involved and said I was also a homophobe because you can't be one without the other, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, mm-hmm. I was. A, that's when the petition was put out, and they actually could not find a student in my classroom that would say that I was any of those things. And I had always had good relationships with my gay students, and in fact, a graduate school student had attended one of my classes and recorded all the lectures, and I didn't know that, but when I was attacked, he uh, told me that he was gay. I didn't know that at the time, and that he had recorded all my lectures and that he had told the faculty that I didn't do any of the things that they said, you know, that I did, that he had never heard me say anything like what uh, some people were saying. Mm -hmm. And the opposition to me was not as local as it was national. It was like conservative professors, and there were five of us across the country that were targeted. So that happened first. So that's 2015. Well, Mm -hmm. 2016, I was on CNN, and this was um, right after the five Dallas police officers were slain. And I was there to talk about Black Lives Matter in a debate with Areva Martin, a lawyer from L.A., And I did my research in that I went to Black Lives Matter website, and I was shocked and stunned by the Marxism and the fact uh, that it had very almost nothing to do with black people. It was all about the LGBT agenda and about uh, getting rid of prisons and police. And this was like 2016. So when I went on the television, I said that they were a destructive force in our society. Mm -hmm. And I was the first to call them out as Marxists. Well, once I did that, that created another firestorm because up until that time, uh, the black faculty and students had stayed out of the fray. Uh, Once that happened, it was like I united all the groups. And I made a decision myself that I could not be my best self if I was in an academic environment because I looked at my age, my likely lifespan, my level of, of stress, 
And I uh, made a decision. I contacted the dean and I said, you know, this is not working. Pretty much I want a divorce. Mm -hmm. And I had a very nice dean and she worked out um, the arrangement and I took early retirement. Good for you. And now that leads us to Unity Training Solutions. Well, I also have to tell you that uh, it was a scary thing to do because if you're a professor Mm -hmm. and that's been your life for 30 years, it's the whole idea of walking away from the only thing you know how to do was pretty scary. Took a lot uh, of courage. Well, and and God has really, uh, you know, redeemed that situation and blessed me, but I had at least two years of uncertainty and wondering where I could get a job and applying for a couple of jobs at a university in a private school and not getting hired. Uh, And so it was a couple of years of uncertainty, but I look back today and it's one of the best things I've ever done in my life. It was such a good decision. And you asked me about unity training. That idea for the organization was birth uh, last summer uh, in August. I was preparing for a talk to be given at the Council on National Policy. And I was on a panel with Bob Bob Woodson Mm -hmm. and Star Parker. And, you know, like they were heavyweights. They'd been on the big stage before. That was my first time on the big stage. (laughs) But I was preparing for that talk, and I had a very restless night. And the restlessness had to do with the rioting that was taking place across our country. And by then, I think it had been going on for like 50 days in a row. And I saw all these corporations, one after another, just pour money into Black Lives Matter and into organizations that I thought had the wrong uh, approach. And I did not feel that what they were doing would ever bring about any kind of racial reconciliation. But I can tell you that I was, it was a restless night and, and I just tossing and turning and I heard unity, unity, (laughs) unity training. And so uh, being the entrepreneur that I fancy myself, I got up first thing in the morning and I went to purchase the domain name Unity Training and it was gone. And so I purchased Unity Training Solutions. So that was the idea. And when I gave my presentation, I talked about the need for Christians and conservatives to to compete in that space with the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion trainers uh, to compete in that space because What often happens is that organizations will bring in people and they will disrupt the workforce. They take Mm -hmm. organizations off their mission. They create conflict where it didn't exist before. And so my vision for unity training is e pluribus unum, out of many one, training that's consistent with our civil rights laws, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, sex, color, national origin, you know, age, uh, and those factors, and our Constitution's Equal Protection Clause. And when it comes to diversity, I think most people embrace diversity. And if you are Christian, you look out at the universe, and there's no denying that God is a God of diversity. You would expect people to be as diverse as all the other creations. And so I wanted to offer a training that would educate people some, but it would keep the focus on the team, what Mm -hmm. the team is producing, what is the mission of the organization, how can we get along. And so part of the training that my organization is offering is the part about the civil rights movement and the laws that have been passed, you know, when it comes to protecting women and racial and ethnic minorities, but it also protects white people. And that's why we have to be very careful that we have not gone to the point that we have such reverse discrimination that we tread one form of illegal, immoral, unconstitutional discrimination for another. My idea is a successful training is when people leave inspired, optimistic, ready to work on behalf of the organization, you know, with some tools that help them become better communicators, better workers, you know, whatever their goals are, but it doesn't disrupt the workplace. And I feel like there has to be options, that it can't be just one shoe fits all, especially when years of research shows that diversity training, as they do it today, doesn't work. 
totally agree with you. And in my new book, Dare to Care in the Workplace, I have two chapters that speak to what you're talking about right now. The first one is have a little faith in me, have the courage to have faith, have the courage to talk about it. And the other one is leading with empathy. Empathy is a hard thing for people to achieve. And does your training at Unity Training Solutions encompass those kind of empathetic training? Listen with compassion and out without judgment to someone else's point of view. Let me tell you that uh, I'm in the process now of writing a, a book about the birth of Unity Training and why it's needed. And from that book comes the curriculum. And I have I've had a, a few clients, but my curriculum is not fully developed. Mm -hmm. uh, and the clients I've had have been in the educational realm, one, and so it's more like one-on-one -on -one or advising people that are in situations where they're being pressured to go in a direction that's against their uh, values and principles. Mm -hmm. So I would love to have your book and read it because I'm in the process of fully developing my idea. And my vision is for it to be like Dale Carnegie courses. My approach is very much based on values and principles and things that I believe um, do make for harmony. And, and key to that is respecting each person's individuality and who they are and where they come from and what they bring and their uniqueness, uh, that you can embrace all of that. But at the same time, you would never want to create a workplace where some people are, are diminished or alienated because of their um, political party or their, or their sex or race or anything about them, that the workplace should not be a place where these things come into play. They totally. should be focused on the mission of the organization. Mm -hmm. Mission of the organization and also embracing all the beautiful differences we all have, because I that know. makes it, that makes the journey so much more beautiful when you can bring together people who come from different walks of life, who can contribute to the team and the mission of the company. Well, I would love to have a copy of your book because I'm literally writing and hoping to get my book out in a couple of months. And, um, and I, I will send you both of my books. I wrote two, one called Solve the People Puzzle. That was my first book. And then born out of that, as you know, as a writer yourself, was Dare to Care in the Workplace, my most recent book. So I most certainly will send that to you, Dr. Swain. Um, what is the advice, especially for business leaders out there, that you would give to them as they look all of these messages in the eye right now and try to build a different kind of organization, what message would you give to them and how they should treat their employees? Well, first of all, I would say to them to be true to their own values. And I find that there are many companies that started off as small family businesses that have grown into multi-million dollar, maybe even billion dollar corporations and the bigger they get, the further they get away from those values and principles that help them rise to where they are today. The job of the CEO or the owner to set the tone for the organization. And sometimes they delegate maybe to the wrong persons because we see corporations that, that have been associated with a particular set of values and principles. And then all of a sudden they do something shocking. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's because they have delegated authority to someone that does not share their values and principles. And I think that uh, with corporations, you're the leader. You need to convey to your employees and to your executives who the organization is, what you believe, and make sure that you're setting the right tone for everyone that is looking to you for leadership. Totally agree with you. I, I call it um, building community. Because com your company is really a community built upon relationships. Yeah, I would agree with that. But they have abused the word community. <laughs> yes, and they've also abused the word culture. <laughs> and and, they, and they're, still in, they're still in e pluribus unum and unity when they're using it in the opposite way from the way I would use it or you would use it. Uh, and so that makes it harder, too, because it's almost like the progressives are moving in a particular direction, they study us, and then they take the words and the ideas and they twist the meaning. 
Mm -hmm. But the good news is there's people like you, Dr. Swain, and me who know who we are, and we will not be shaken. That's <laughs> we will amen. not be <laughs> shaken. So I want to thank you so much for being with me today. And you talked a lot about your mentors. One of my mentors in my life was my father. He left this earth at 92, and he already he always told me to shoot for the moon. If I got halfway there, he'd be proud of me. And I'd say, Dr. Swain, you have shot for the moon yourself. And uh, let's keep shooting for the moon together. So thank you so much for being with me today. If people want to find out more about you, how do they do that? What's the best way for them to do that? I am on all the major social media platforms, but I have websites I would direct them to. There's unitytrainingsolutions.com, and that would be for business leaders or people that would like to know more about the Unity Training Solutions vision. I have bethepeoplenews.com, and there I post uh, blogs, videos, news clips. Uh, that's a very active page, Be the People News. Instead of We the People, it's bethepeoplenews.com. And um, I have a nonprofit, Be the People Nonprofit. That page um, shows you, you know, what I do uh, for the community. And then I'm on Twitter as at Carol M. Swain. I'm on Instagram and Facebook as Dr. Carol M. Swain. I'm on uh, Gitter uh, as Carol M. Swain. And, you know, pretty much if you Google, you find me all over the place. And my latest books are Black Eye for America, How Critical Race Theory is Burning Down the House. And then my first Christian book that was published in September is Countercultural Living, What Jesus Has to Say About uh, Life, Marriage, Race and Ethnicity, Gender Identities, and Materialism. Well, you are a gift, Dr. Swain. And thank you for being on my podcast. Thank you, and I look forward to meeting you. I do too. Her name is Dr. Carol Swain, and that's it for another episode of Dare to Care in the Workplace. I hope you enjoyed the show, and if you did, make sure you take a second to subscribe so you automatically get my new shows when they drop. Also, if you have a minute, I'd love if you left me a review so more folks like yourself can discover the show. Until we meet again. This has been Dare to Care in the Workplace. To connect with Kathleen, go to KathleenQuinnBotaw.com. Kathleen's book, Dare to Care, is available wherever books are sold. Dare to Care in the Workplace is a production of Forbes Books.